When Nelson roamed the seven seas, he never guessed that one day there would be an eighth. A pity that Britain's greatest sailor never sailed into the heart of the oldest dominion. But Nelson was before his time, because it was only in June 1959 that the Queen and President Eisenhower officially opened the Great St. Lawrence Seaway, and ships from the oceans of the world could sail 2,000 miles into the heart of North America. Suddenly, Canada had a south coast, and the United States a north coast. At last, it was possible to load grain in Duluth and sail it to London, or load textiles in Liverpool and unload them in Chicago. Men had been dreaming of this for 300 years. It was in 1563 that Jack Cartier sailed nearly a thousand miles up the St. Lawrence River until he was stopped by rapids. At this place, a hundred years later, a handful of French colonists founded Montreal. Here is Canada's greatest city and port, a thousand miles from the sea. Here is the start of the most exciting, ambitious, and controversial project the world has ever known, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Twenty-two thousand men worked on it for four years. They and their machines dug out 51 million cubic yards of rock and soil. They dredged 18 million cubic yards of channels. They poured two million cubic yards of concrete using 10 million bags of cement. And the cost? Over a billion dollars. Sometimes, in spite of the ingenuity of the engineers and the planners, the seaway just couldn't dodge a town. Iroquois was one place that was due for flooding. So they moved everything that was worth moving and built a new town a mile away. In Iroquois, if you said you were moving house, boy, you meant it. It took 20 years to build the Panama Canal. The St. Lawrence Seaway was finished in four. Let's take a trip up the new seaway from Montreal to Niagara. First stage takes us up to Lake St. Louis. The Jacques Cartier Bridge was 60 feet too low for seaway traffic. So they jacked up the spans near the middle into an elegant curve and put in a new center section. The first lock is the St. Lambert, where the seaway passes under one of the busiest rail and road bridges in the country. To raise this bridge 120 feet over the seaway would have cost a fabulous amount of money. But if the bridge had to be opened like Tar Bridge every time a ship passed under, there would be traffic chaos on the road and railway. So they built two vertical lift bridges, one at each end of the lock. While a ship is entering the lock, the traffic is diverted to the bridge at the other end. is the Côte St. Catherine Lock, which raises ships another 36 feet up the river. Six miles further on are two more bridges, a road bridge and a railway bridge. These weren't too much of a problem, but the Lachine Rapids were. They had to be bypassed. And now the seaway lets our ships out onto Lake St. Louis. A pretty lake, but too shallow. And a 27-foot channel had to be dredged. To build two locks, the canal, and the power station at Pohornois, meant digging more ground than the builders of the Panama Canal. These two locks raised the ships another 80 feet to the level of Lake St. Francis.
45 miles further on, at Cornwall, we come to the new International High Level Bridge, one end in Canada, the other in the United States. For the first time, the St. Lawrence Seaway passes through American territory. We Canadians built and paid for 75% of the Seaway. It took the Americans 30 years to make up their minds to come in with us, but finally they realized this was good for us both, and we get along fine. And now, at Eisenhower Lock, they take their families out on Sunday afternoons to see the world's shipping passing through the United States. Here is the control dam at Iroquois, and the old town is at the bottom of the lake. 100-year-old homesteads have been replaced by a $14 million lock and canal. Above Iroquois, the seaway leads clear into Lake Ontario, the first of the Great Lakes. Toronto is the fastest growing city on the continent and the center of Canada's richest industrial area. But industry needs power. Without a desperate need for hydroelectric power in Ontario and New York, the St. Lawrence Seaway might still be waiting to be built. Niagara Falls provides an enormous source of power, but still not enough. So extra power is obtained further down the river at the International Rapids and at Bohornwall. Alongside Niagara, in utter contrast to the roar of tumbling water, runs the peaceful Welland Canal. Its seven locks raise ships 325 feet, so they may pass from Lake Ontario onto Lake Erie. And now the great industries in the very heart of the continent have direct access to the oceans and markets of the world. Uranium ore, power for the world of the future. Timber for building, for matches, for our daily paper. Europe can regard Montreal and Toronto as the largest ports on Canada's south coast. Chicago, the biggest on the United States' north coast. An eighth sea has been added to the seventh a sea with a coastline of 8,000 miles, a sea 2,000 miles inside a continent. <laughs>